Okay, welcome everybody. So we continue, and now this is the first time we have this uh, uh, Wednesday session uh, visiting lecture. So that's, as you may remember, the idea was that these Wednesdays we would take these sort of practical things because this ML engineering is a pretty practical issue, and the idea was to collect uh, these type of real-life cases and real-life people who have worked on this and have seen have seen the problems, have seen the challenges, have solved the challenges and fought, fought with them a lot. So, so I guess this is the opportunity to learn from how things are really done in, in real life. And I'm really happy to welcome uh, Dimitri to, to give this talk. Um, so he's from Busware, a Finnish company doing invoice management. I guess he will tell a bit more how, how things are going and what, what the company is doing. But um, that's the idea that you should not just learn what you can do with uh, machine learning, but also what kind of things and what kind of challenges they have had and what kind of solutions they have maybe come up with to, to deal with those. And as always, I guess uh, it's good if you have questions, comments, so, so I guess you can also sort of interrupt Dimitri and ask, ask whenever there's something that you would like to, like to know or question about him. So that's it. Then, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Okay, that's good. Yeah, just a couple of words about myself. Uh, I came to Finland 1999. Uh, as an exchange postgraduate student, I was working in the uh, University of St. Petersburg uh, physics department and uh, Professor Matti Vorinen from Mathematical Department of University of Helsinki invited me as an exchange student for, to work uh, for one month. And uh, this is how I came to Finland first time. And uh, uh, then I was employed by Nokia. I worked as a software engineer in Nokia for 12 years. Then uh, went to Seven Networks, a uh, small startup company, then to Busware. In Busware, I worked for 10 years. The last five years, I work in an AI project called Smart PDF AI. <coughs> so that project is uh, designated for extracting data from invoice documents. There, there is a huge uh, diversity of uh, types of these documents in different languages, different countries. Pretty much every company ha has... Uh, uh, th it's, there is no standard, so every company uh, makes own uh, style for the invoice and... Uh, we count at the moment million types of invoices coming to our pipe, but in the world there, there are tens, tens of millions of types of invoices and, and the whole traffic is, uh, uh, I think, billions of invoices per, per month or per year. Yeah, so this is what our company is doing. We are processing or streaming that traffic between companies, helping them understand invoices, helping them uh, uh, put the data in the right uh, table cells uh, and our AI project is uh, automating that uh, understanding part. So when it sees completely unknown invoice it is supposed to have some idea uh, about where the where is the total, where is the due date, where, where, where is the invoice number, or some, uh, things like that and it, it's supposed to be accurate enough because this is a financial document so making mistakes uh, may cause severe financial damage. So our model needs to be very accurate, and that's the, that's the problem. Um, our project is uh, part, uh, well, it's subsidized partly by uh, Business Finland, and we are part of a larger project, IML4E, which unites multiple companies and also uh, also scientific organizations uh, such as University of Helsinki. <coughs> we have meetings and, and, and there we, uh, I met uh, Professor Jukka Nurminen who invited me uh, to give this visiting lecture. Thank you very much, Professor. And it's uh, a big honor for me to, to uh, be able to speak in front of a university audience. Uh, it's actually my second visiting lecture in the University of Helsinki, and the previous one was given uh, 23 years ago. Yeah, so I have uh, yeah, special feelings about this. 
Yeah. Okay. So let's let's start. Uh, I have lots of slides. I need to uh, be very quick. Uh, still, interruptions are welcome. And um, uh, well, let's hope I make it in in this time slot. It's it's very challenging. <coughs> uh, so data cleaning the subject uh, uh, is data cleaning, and this is the problem statement. This is. Uh, already briefly covered it. We are extracting data from the documents. We need to be accurate. And uh, our main model is a supervised uh, model. It's trained in a classical way with human annotations. Human makes mi make mistakes. Errare humanum est. So um, that's a big problem. Because our model overfits to these errors and it delivers uh, suboptimal accuracy. And it's very painful. So we need to do something about it. And the amount of human errors is, is actually sometimes is very, very big. And uh, sometimes it's just random mistake, but sometimes people just consistently misunderstand the meaning of the field and they make biased mistakes, which are systematic and is extremely difficult to spot as outliers. But anyway, this is the challenge. We need to spot the outliers, remove them from the data set, and then train the model. Well, doesn't sound like a challenging task to you or not. Removing outliers, challenging, OK. But it's actually very easy. It's very simple. Let's have an exercise. So um, here is a data set. We need to remove the outlier. I vote for removing this red dot here. Who objects that? Please raise your hand if you think that some other dot should be removed from this data set than the red one. No objections, right? OK. That's, of course, obviously the right answer. And that's, the, that's why all, this, all the dots here are in line. <coughs> the red one is not in line, so it's obviously an outlier that needs to be removed. OK? Easy, right? Now, what if I tell you that this answer is wrong? And it's because of this. So this data set was a sample from harmonic function, not linear. And the outlier is uh, this blue dot here. How do you cope with that? So there are two explanations of the same data set, <coughs> completely different, and they give different outliers. How, how would you resolve that ambiguity? Any ideas? Okay. Maybe you have domain knowledge and you know that the data is not a linear function. Excellent. So one thing is to just freeze the, the class of curves. If we know in advance that we are dealing with harmonic functions, we freeze it, we never consider linear explanation, right? Or if we know it's linear, we never consider harmonic. That's one way. Another, other ideas, how we can improve it. How we can resolve the ambiguity. It's, it's obvious, well, I made up this. Of course, it's a coincidence that they, but it, this coincidence will not run forever, right? At some point, it will become obvious that one of the curves is not explaining the data set. So how we can solve that ambiguity in other way? Sorry? More data. More data. So you are reading my slides. So it's either freezing the, selecting the family of curves or adding more data. OK, well, easy. Let's add more data. So this is our original data set. <coughs> now I'll start adding more data. OK, more data. Does it give you any idea? More? OK. Still no idea? All right. Let's just see the pattern. Somebody sees the pattern? Not yet. How about now? Uh-huh. It's coming. 
Hello. All right. So this was the secret behind this data set. It was actually hello word, and uh, the outliers are green dot and the blue dot. Uh-oh. Houston, we have a problem. So there are actually three explanations. Three explanations. We were adding data and it didn't help, or kind of helped. But why it helped? Because we know how Latin letters are spelled, right? So we have a prior knowledge, and, and because we have prior knowledge, we could recognize the pattern. But if we wouldn't know the letters, we wouldn't recognize it either. Well, guess that this was uh, a greeting from Mars. And in Martian alphabet, these letters H and O, they have umlauts. So all the points are correct. The blue and the green was part of the Mar Martian alphabet, right? Because we knew the letters, we had prior knowledge. So it happens to be that adding more data is not a solution for cleaning the data set. Now, well, at least in this example. So we need some other types of prior knowledge uh, in order to be able to clean the, the data. For example, well, freezing the curve is, is fine. And, uh, or we, for example, we have a knowledge about uh, alphabet. That type of prior knowledge helps us finding the pattern. But if we just keep adding more data, we don't solve the problem, at least this problem. Okay, well, is this a, a generic problem? Okay, another note I, I wanted to highlight, this is a bit like a side note, that uh, if we would freeze uh, the curve hypothesis and we keep adding data, like I did, would any of the models that would stick to the curve explanation, would they fit to this data set? No. No matter how much data I would add, if I have incorrect assumption in my model, it will, it will not fit at all. Uh, so it looks like also, in order to be efficient, before I fit to the data, I need to have prior knowledge. I need to pr first select a correct model, and then I can fit to my data. So is this, is this really a generic problem, or it's just an, this bad example? Uh, but it's not generic. So is it, is it like, in general, if we keep adding data, will we eventually reveal the pattern? So, so can data replace prior knowledge? Well, data is also a knowledge, but it's like posterior knowledge. It's, it's experimental knowledge, uh, phenomenal knowledge, right? And prior knowledge is this nominal knowledge. So is this a fundamental problem? Let's, let's, um, let's have another example that will show that adding data will not help. So this is another challenge. We need to find a way to separate blue and red dots. So let's keep adding data. Let's add more data. Maybe, maybe we find f some pattern here that will help us uh, separating this. More data? No idea, right? Doesn't help. I can keep adding this random random dots, and still I will never find the way to separate them. But what if I know that I was looking at the projection of a cube, and uh, the blue dots are lying on one side of the cube, red ones are lying on the other side of the cube, then there is a very clear separation. So if I have a knowledge, I can separate it easily. It's, it is, by the way, the kernel trick. When you, when you have knowledge about some hidden internal parameter in your data set, then you can sometimes easily separate your data set into classes with just plain. Uh, but if you don't know that there is a hidden parameter that can separate like this, you can add data forever, and you will not be able to separate it. So the hidden knowledge solves the problem. Uh, the prior knowledge solves the problem that no amount of data will solve. But how about these uh, large language models? They seem to be uh, in contradiction with that, because they, 
they have virtually no assumptions about any knowledge. And they suck the knowledge from the data. They suck it from internet, from huge amounts of data, and they become smart. Uh, so what's the trick? What's the trick here? Because they obviously they learn from data, not from prior knowledge. They don't have any prior knowledge. Then they they are trained with a huge data set. They get the knowledge from data, and then they start answering questions. And these answers make perfect sense. So they seem sound like a miracle. This is not a surprise that uh, these models, they, they make so much hype because it's, um, they are really miraculous. Do they violate some fundamental principles or what's, what's, what's the trick here? Well, that that's tur turns to be a, a very non-trivial question and it's time to ask opinions of, of very influential people. So this, this person, I hope you know him, Noam, Ch Noam Chomsky. How many people know him? Yeah, okay, that's good. And by the way, at he's still alive, n age 94, and still g giving interviews. And uh, he's at the moment the most cited living scientist in the world. So the most influential living scientist. And uh, founder of computational linguistics, Emeritus Professor of MIT. And uh, the guys were interviewing him last year and uh, asking about this GPT-3, what is his opinion. He gives actually very little value to GPT-3. He says, well, it's kind of a database. It's just a, it's just a search engine. It, well, it pretends to have knowledge, but doesn't have a knowledge. It's just uh, responds, it just stores the knowledge it found in the Internet and it just uh, uh, returns it back in 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 a form that that is impressive, but uh, it doesn't actually reveal the the logic behind that knowledge. And um, but now we are talking about data cleaning and uh, the problem of adding more data and getting knowledge from that more data and. Uh, uh, there is this part of interview that I, I wanted to play back. Uh, let's hope I, I succeed. I think it's this one. The useful way to look at it is to think of what have been major problems. They've actually been given names. So let's use the name. Uh, the Plater problem. How can we know so much with so little evidence? Well, the problem is badly misunderstood. And there's, uh, we started off by talking about what one of the misunderstandings, the idea that if you have enough data, you know, trillions and trillions amount of it, and you have battery of supercomputers working, you're going to deal with this problem. No, you're not. You're going to get nowhere. You can show in advance that you're going to get nowhere. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I will interrupt at, at this point, but uh, hmm. that's the point. You have trillions and trillions of amount of data. You have lots of supercomputers. You think it will solve the problem? No, it won't. And uh, here he explains why. That's another part of that video. I recommend watching this interview fully because it's, it's, it's quite amazing. So he's giving analogy. General saying, I've got a fantastic new theory and accommodates all the laws of nature, the ones that are known, the ones that have yet to have been discovered. And it's such an elegant theory that I can say it in two words. Anything goes. Okay. That includes all the laws of nature, the ones we know, the ones we do not know yet, everything. What's the problem? The problem is they're not going to accept the paper because when you have a theory, there are two kinds of questions you have to ask. Why are things this way? Why are things not that way? If you don't get the second question, you've done nothing. GPT-3 has done nothing. How about that? Well, he was uh, 93 years old moment of giving this interview. He's just an amazing person. 
I mean, how can you be so smart and following all this complex development of science at the age of 93 and be up to it fully? Uh, well, okay. But anyway, uh, anything goes. That's the problem. So if we rely only on data, we don't have any assumptions. Anything goes. Just give me more data, I will reveal the patterns. No, you will not reveal the patterns. Because if everything goes, you simply memorize the data, it's a database. It's just a database. Yeah, please, question. Okay, let's let's come let's let's get to this topic because it will get more and more complex little by little. Uh, I will come to similar similar idea to reinforcement learning. It's a genetic programming, it's meta learning, but it's 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 similar idea. So you iterate your model, not not you you do not train your model, but you iterate the model design. So it's like a meta learning, and you can do it also with reinforcement learning. Yeah, so this will be covered in the next slides. But so far, so far, we just need to make clear that if we don't have any prior knowledge, just data doesn't help. We just memorize the data, but it, the database has zero prediction power because it doesn't have any restrictions. According to Noam Chomsky, it doesn't answer the question that why things cannot be that way. It says the things is this way, why it cannot be that way? Well, I don't know. Anything goes. So we need we need uh, prior knowledge. So these are just examples of how prior knowledge is expressed in machine learning uh, universe. We can freeze the family of curves. This example that we have seen. Uh, Family of probability distributions, conjugate priors, that's, that's in Bayesian world. That's about Bayesian models. Then uh, some systems of equations, some limitations expressed mathematically as equations. Uh, choice of ML model, choice of net neural network architecture, feature engineering, and data annotation. Data annotation doesn't seem like a model, but it, this is where you also express the knowledge. If you annotate data uh, by, by humans, of course they, they use their knowledge to, to apply labels to the data. So that's, that's a little bit special case. But all the other cases, they can be, um, can be expressed under one umbrella, like a concept of model. So the model is where you put your knowledge where you put your restrictions. And, and you start with a model, and then you fit that model to the data. So who, who nailed, who coined actually? Yeah, the right way to say this is who coined the term model. And, and it's this guy, uh, Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz. Uh, pretty pretty far away, 18th century. Um, he is known as the last universal genius. He was excellent at everything he was doing, and he was doing everything. Mathematician, philosopher, theologist, diplomat. He is known as a founder of computer science because he is the one who invented the first kind of concept of a programming language. And uh, he was the one who, who coined the term model because he was thinking that you can automate, well, you can automate arithmetics operations, but you can also automate other than arithmetics. And this is the machine that he invented, stepped Reckoner, 1694, 
think about that. And um, but this was just an ordinary arithmometer, ordinary, not ordinary, of course. This is a genius invention. But uh, he was thinking further. He was thinking that can we automate more complex cognitive skills? Can they, they be mechanically automated? And and he invented a framework for building such machines. Uh, he called it calculus ratiocinator. I don't know, even know how to spell it properly. And he invented a, a first uh, programming language. It wasn't a really a programming language, but it's a language of expressing uh, conceptual things with, with like a mathematical notation. That that's uh, Characteristica Universalis. And so, by inventing these two things, he invented computer science, pretty much. Uh, so that's the. That's the that's how the first model looked like. Okay, how how is it now? Well, uh, this is. Please take this with a with a grain of salt. This taxonomy is just. Uh, well, I, I just tried to briefly review the whole universe of models that we deal with in machine learning now. So the, the models, uh, so I split it like deterministic, non-deterministic. Deterministic means if you give it x, it, it, it answers you with y, and it's the same x, the same y. Non-deterministic, you give it x, it answers with y, you give it the same x, it answers with different y. So there is a noise within the model that makes uh, the answers random. And that's non-deterministic models. And then deductive and inductive. Deductive models are more like logical, symbolic models. They are discrete. They are very difficult to optimize because because of this discreteness. And they uh, they are monotonic, meaning that uh, in in deductive logic you deduce the facts from the bigger facts. So if the a smaller fact contradicts with a bigger fact, it's it's bad for the smaller fact you refute the smaller fact with a bigger fact. In inductive logic, is, it's vice versa. The smaller fact refutes the bigger fact. So if you have uh, one experiment that contradicts with your theory, that's bad for the theory. I in deductive, if, if that fact contradicts with the theory, it's bad for the fact. Uh, well, inductive logic. Imagine that you, you have seen million white swans and you have a very strong assumption that black swans don't exist, right? So that's your theory, that's your experimental theory based on a huge amount of facts. And then you see one single black swan. That completely refutes the theory, that, that destroys the theory completely. So uh, with inductive logic, it's non-monotonic, meaning that one single fact can kill the huge theory completely. Uh, the, the knowledge is not growing, it's, it's always flipping upside down, while with deductive logic it's growing. But deductive logic is, it, it has the feature of emergency, meaning that when you change it, it's a symbolic system, you never modify symbolic systems gradually, you modify them in transactions. You start changing, it becomes inconsistent, then you stop changing, you make it consistent again, and in between, like you make computer program, you, uh, you 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 go from commit to commit, and between commits, you modify your code. It doesn't even compile. So, that's that's the feature of uh, deductive models, and also they they solve completely different problems, and they they do not overlap with each other. For example, with uh, formal uh, models, you can easily do list sorting. But you cannot tr train, there were multiple attempts, they all failed. You cannot train any uh, machine learning model to do the list uh, number sorting. They, they could do, for example, number mu multiplication. You can multiply it deductively. You can also train machine learning model to, to do the multiplication of numbers. And it will learn to multiply numbers. But, for example, list sorting is not. So th these are different areas. And, uh, okay, so the... These deductive deterministic models are more like what Leibniz was thinking of. So it, they are mechanical devices or formal devices. The, this, this corner, inductive deterministic, this is when you add tunable parameters. And if you add 
very many tunable parameters. It turns to a neural network, artificial neural network. But the main point is that it's still deterministic. So if you, f if you throw a vector to a neural network, it replies you with a vector. If you throw again the same vector, it replies again with the same vector. So, so it sounds like uh, it is non-deterministic, but in fact, uh, artificial neural networks are deterministic models. But if you consider Bayesian, like, uh, let's say, TensorFlow probability, there you don't have that. You give it x, you receive y, you give the same x, you receive another y. You get a random noise, which has a distribution, and this distribution is what matters. Not a single sample doesn't, matter, m doesn't mean anything. So these are this, this corner, and the most interesting, this one, and this is what you, you were asking about. So can you optimize the logic stochastically? It happens to be that, yes, it is possible to add non-determinism to a formal logic. But in this case, you would be modifying your formula randomly and then finding the best formula. The, uh, you can... This meta, the idea of meta-learning is that you, you start searching for a proper model in iterative manner, in, in kind of stochastic manner. And there are many words for that. Hyper-heuristics, meta-heuristics, meta-learning, program induction, genetic programming, all, all kinds of terms uh, about like randomly picking the, logic, the logical thing. Okay, so, yeah, but back to the original question. Now we need to reformulate it. Um, it was obvious for us that, well, I hope it was obvious, maybe not, but that we cannot get rid of the model completely, right? If we just add more data, it doesn't help. So the posterior knowledge, the experimental knowledge, does not remove the need for prior knowledge, for theoretical knowledge. So you, you need to have some kind of model before you can explain things uh, experimentally. But then there comes another question. Uh, okay, we need the model, that's fine. Okay, but can we have just one model, one magic model? For example, this reinforcement learning, AlphaGo, okay, magically learns how to play chess and nobody's giving any idea about how to play chess. Uh, in best way, it just plays with itself, self-play, and evolves, and suddenly it outplays all other computer programs and all, all human beings. Well, it's not listed here, but it should be listed here, uh, Alpha, Alpha Zero, by Google. But anyway, we have these models that pretend to be uh, general models. They they even have a name. OpenAI is now advertising <coughs> their models as general models. So we train it for you, you come, you ask a question, you get answer, you don't need to train, it's universal, it's, it's God model, it's, it knows everything. Well, is this utopian thinking or is it reality? So can we really think that there could be a, in principle, like universal algorithm, some magic algorithm that um, covers all, all the problems in machine learning at once? Well, it's a big question. And um, partly it was answered by David Wolpert and William, William McCready, 1997. They published these famous theorems which they called no free lunch theorems. And uh, they, they have proven that if you have, let's say, a model with random performance, just randomly tuned weights, and well, this is uh, equivalently bad in all domains. It's not trained, it's not fitted. It is ra it's random performance can be random in every place. But once you start fit the model to a particular task, to a particular problem, then you need to pay back with, th with the fact that it will be ultimately bad in many other domains. 
So once it starts overfitting to one problem, it starts being very bad for other problems. And there is no way out. It's it's mathematical fact. Okay, these theorems, they, when they were published, they, they caused lots of hype and discussion and uh, lots of feedback and after studies. Because they started asking that, okay, what, what are the what is the applicability when we have so many types of models where these theorems apply? And it seems to be like they do not apply to all types of models, but they definitely apply to these trainable models. So when you train model, when you fit it to the data, then, at least in this column, there is no concept of universal model. It's utopian thinking. No. You will never get any model that will fit to the data in every possible domains equivalently well. No, nope. no way. But there is still this corner. Uh, meta learning. And and this is well I just here just random list of papers that are showing uh, well there are hundreds of them more. I just highlighted few of them. You can see from the names of the papers, okay. When meta heuristics researchers can ignore no free lunch, meta heuristics, okay. Co evolutionary free lunches. The same authors, by the way, who proven the, the, the theorem, they they started looking for for limits uh, of these theorems that where they, they do not apply. And they found that co-evolutionary models, the models of genetic programming, they, they actually help you escaping from the boundaries of no free lunch. Free lunch is for function and program induction. Program induction, another another name for meta learning. Evaluation of evolutionary and genetic optimizers. No free lunch. Okay. Evolutionary algorithms and domain knowledge. Real world evolutionary computation. That's it. So evolution. That's the that's the keyword here. Maybe this is the supermodel. Can we then think of genetic programming as a supermodel? Or maybe Reinforcement learning. So is, is there a supermodel somewhere outside of these uh, inductive types of models? Well, we don't know. But it seems to be if they would be such models, they, they would probably be used. But obviously, these general models, OpenAI, Google, they don't use any genetic programming. And actually, genetic programming occupies very modest niche. Uh, we don't hear too much about genetic programming, some some phenomenal results, some some amazing achievements. Well, they solve some problems. They solve some difficult problems, indeed. They help you escaping from no free lunch. But how far you can escape? Can you escape? Can you just forget about no free lunch? Or you just a little bit extend the border of no free lunch, but not much? Okay, well, things get harder and harder. <sighs> this guy doesn't require introduction, right? He's a father of evolution. Uh, modern evolution theory, of course, includes the knowledge about genetics. And it assumes that there is a universal or kind of a genetic algorithm that uh, generates <laughs> has generated all, all the forms of life. And uh, of course, there are multiple experiments trying to prove it. And some of these experiments are very successful and uh, uh, very visual. They show that really this uh, uh, concept of mutations and crossover and natural selection, it really works. You can optimize living beings you can have resistance to antibiotics, things like that. It really works. The question is, can it explain all the diversity of life? That's another question. But the theory of evolution works. No question about that. The question is, is it applicable to everything? Uh, so, of course, the next challenge is to 
just show such an algorithm that can do that, that can generate DNA codes. And uh, the first attempt known so far, I think it's from 1960 by Lawrence Fogel, who, who, who ran the first genetic or uh, evolutionary algorithm. Well, at this, at this year, he probably didn't have any good computers to, to run. But anyway, since that time, okay, more than 50 years passed and more than 60. And we still don't hear much about um, uh, invention of such algorithm that would explain uh, the DNA evolution. Well, there are multiple genetic algorithms invented. There is a whole science about it. But uh, still, the applications of these algorithms are very limited. It's quite modest, in fact. So there is a growing skepticism that is it really a, a, magic, thi a magic thing that can, that can do what it uh, is expected to do. And why, why is this skepticism, where it is coming from? Well, let's go even deeper. Aristotle. This is the, maybe the, the most clever man of the mankind ever. Because he basically invented science. He invented all scientific directions. Uh, all, all major scientific directions are based on, 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 on his, his writings, which were classified then later. Well, he invented the word energy. That's, that's one thing gives him so much honor. Think of, of that. Before him, the word energy didn't exist. He invented it. Energy comes with synergy. Uh, synergy is, uh, is not invented by Aristotle, but uh, the principle of synergy is invented by Aristotle. He expressed it in, 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 in this way. The whole is greater than the sum of the, its parts. Not always, but uh, one example is combustion engine. So it consists of some metallic things. But if you just put, uh, put all the spare parts of, of the combustion engine, on the table, randomly. Okay, it's just a heap of metal. And that's what combustion engine is. It's a sum of its parts, right? But if you put them in a proper order, in a proper position, you connect all the wires, all the pipes, everything according to some kind of design, then suddenly this a heap of metal turns to a machine that converts chemical energy to mechanical energy through thermodynamic energy. So it's a very complex device that has a function that suddenly appears when you connect the last wire. And this is called synergetic effect. When you connect last wire and suddenly the heap of metal turns into a very complex system that has a new function that didn't exist and didn't belong to any of its parts. It's also called emergence in complex systems. There is a whole big science, uh, the science of complex systems that studies this uh, synergetic effects. And uh, it seems to be that uh, life is full of these synergetic properties or emergent properties. It comes from this word emerge, emerge, suddenly appear. And, uh, well, you know, probably uh, everybody of you have, has written at least one computer program so you know that you do it in, in transactions, commit by commit, and every time you add a new feature, it emerges. When you do the commit, it emerges. It's not coming gradually. If you change letter by letter, it's not getting better and better. It actually gets broken in the middle. And then when you add the last letter, that makes sense. You get new feature. So it's actually very typical to have emergent properties from symbolic systems, from symbolically described systems. And life is like that. DNA is the program. Um, so what, what actually genetic algorithms cannot explain is how you can optimize the features that cannot be optimized gradually. Because their loss function is not differentiable. You cannot apply gradient there. 
it suddenly appears and actually it, it uh, well imagine that, that uh, I would construct the trunk of an elephant little by little I add muscles I add skin I had ner nerves, but it's not functional yet. Would it give any uh, benefit to the elephant in terms of natural selection? Well, imagine the elephant with just a hanging, a hanging piece of muscles and skin. It's, it's, it's a burden. It's not giving any profit. That, that type of elephant with partly functioning trunk will not win in, in terms of natural selection. It will lose. So it will also lose the trunk. But uh, only if you connect everything carefully, connect it to the brain, you have a special brain structure that manipulates this uh, complex uh, muscle system. Only then you can reach the far branches and become more competitive uh, in, in comparison with other animals who cannot reach that far. But it, it is emergent property. So it looks like... Um, Genetic programming explains how to create non-emergent properties, but it doesn't explain how to create emergent properties. Examples. Uh, the long-running experiment with Ichirichia coli. Uh, they were running it for tens of years, and suddenly, in one of these jars, um, they found bacteria that was able to consumes sodium citrate. Magic, magic. So, evolution. Really, this is no joke. But if you look closer, what happened is that it's just one protein that changed its shape a little bit. So, the sodium citrate molecule could be uh, penetrating through the membra membrane. And uh, it's just a little change in one existing protein. It's not an emergent property. It's just... Th there is no new consumption mechanism that was created. It's not any anything complex, any kind of new system that was built so that this bacteria could feed from sodium citrate. No, it's just a little change. It's just a little change, a big difference. Resistance to antibiotics. That's okay. I hope I have time to show this video because this is an amazing video. It, sh it is so... Uh, good visualization of the evolution. So, the resistance to antibiotics experiment. So, what we ended up building was basically a petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands, and at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's Barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic, up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. After about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. So evolution, it happens, no doubt. But, um, again, if you look closer, what happened here? Resistance to antibiotics is actually... Uh, antibiotic is a very specific molecule that attacks another molecule, the protein, 
uh, the protein of the bacteria. If that protein changes its formula, that effect disappears. And uh, as it changes further, the effect degrades further. So it's a mutation that actually switches off more complex behavior to more simple. That, that seems to be more beneficial to the bacteria. <coughs> so uh, getting from complex to simple sometimes is profitable in terms of natural selection. So there is no resistance mechanism that is designed magically. So bacteria does not develop a complex resistance mechanism. In fact, it is more complex mechanism of antibiotic acting on the molecule, which degrades and that gives the profit to the uh, bacteria. So it's a simplification, not, compli not complication. So it's again, it's not a an, it's not an, uh, demonstration of emergent feature. Crossover. This is a little bit outdated. I was actually, I was, uh, crossover is a term of genetic programming. I was going to talk about crossbreed, actually. So this uh, crossover in real life is a crossbreed. You're crossbreeding species. But anyway, the main points here is that you always manipulate existing features. You, you, you combine existing features. Wh when you do crossbreed, you never invent new proteins. You never invent new mechanisms. You are, it's, you are just combining the combination of plugins, like pre-existing plugins. Uh, and you can do lots of variations. Many, you can be very creative, but you do not create any new mechanisms. You are combining existing mechanisms, existing proteins, existing genes. And, and there is obvious limitation. You cannot breed animal like this cat dog or dog cat or whatever. It's impossible. Everybody knows that you cannot breed cats from dogs. You cannot breed dogs from cats. There are bound borders just because you are not inventing anything new. Crossbreed is uh, combining things that existed before. Again, no emergence here. Okay, let's go to... Um, there's not a video here, but I don't have time. Anyway, the, <coughs> the idea of this experiment, it's a, it's a computer experiment with evolution. Uh, there is a DNA. The DNA encodes the neural system. Then, then, then the, the, uh, this <coughs> the living being with this neural system is injected into a training environment where it competes with uh, other, uh, well, classical genetic programming setup. And this is what they get as a result. This is a nervous system of the artificial organism that, that is very optimal, in fact. It's very competitive, but there is no structure here. And they, they, <coughs> they uh, confess that there is no structure. It's not explainable. It's not describable. It's a chaotic organism that, that is still uh, competing very well with other org organisms. So it is optimal, but chaotic which means that it's uh, not, em not emergent. You can m optimize this structure gradually. And this is what genetic programming does. It <coughs> gradually modifies something chaotic, which, which becomes better and better, but still there is no structure. There is no emergent properties. OK, enough theory. Let's go to conclusions and examples. So. There seems to be no evidence that we can go beyond the border of, uh, of uh, <coughs> no free lunch theorem. Genetic programming is not a solution. Uh, reinforcement learning is not a solution. There is no uh, supermodel. The idea of supermodel is likely to be utopian. Likely. There is no proof, but it's very likely that we don't have solution that would be fitting to all domains simultaneously with some magic genetic or whatever reinforcement algorithm. No, that's utopian. What does it mean for data cleaning? Now, let's get back to, to the Earth. So, <coughs> data cleaning is not possible without prior knowledge. If you think that you just add more data and it cleans itself, that's utopian thinking. No. Uh, there is no genetic data cleaning algorithm either. You cannot just have one, you take it from the shelf, apply it, it works. 
Well, it may suddenly, well, it, randomly it may work if you if you're lucky to pick the algorithm that fits your domain, but then it will not work in other domains. So, the better the understanding of the constraints of the domain, the more chances to detect outliers in the data. You you cannot avoid knowledge. You cannot avoid hard work. <coughs> you need to design your model into your domain, and then that will be efficient in cleaning the, your data. But you need to have that knowledge. You cannot avoid programming. You cannot avoid coding. You cannot avoid mathematical modeling. And this is good news for us because it means that we are not fired. And it, it has actually very deep philosophical roots. We, we went down to Charles Darwin and Aristotle and still we didn't get, get any answer. We just get more questions. Well, 2,000 years, no, no answers. Okay, now, this is <laughs> what this lecture is all about. Okay, data cleaning <laughs> in our project. It's done with a model called Mosquito. Mosquito, it, it is a smart animal. It's actually very smart. Well, it, it competes with you during the night and it always wins. <coughs> and uh, and, uh, and uh, it is smart in a way that we build as much as possible domain knowledge into this model to, to do to do efficient data cleaning. So we we've built as much as possible understanding about invoice into the model, following this principle that more knowledge, cleaner the data. Um, it's it's using a context free grammar concept. And uh, it, after Mosquito has done its job in, def in detecting outliers in the data, we do this uh, negative boosting kind of, I don't know, this, this term is invented. Negative boosting is, is uh, well, you know the boosting. When you have a model, it performs bad in certain sample. You want it to perform better on that sample, you increase the sample weight, right? So next time you train next epoch, uh, the model pays more attention to the, to the place where it made a mistake. But what if that sample is actually the mistake of a human and not mistake of a model? And, and model makes mistake for a good reason because that's, that's the outlier. So then, then you would like to down, down weight that. So you decrease the weight. And this is what we do. It seems to be working. So our final model, our production model, reaches the above human level of accuracy. We have proven that. So if we remove human errors from the data set, the model actually starts performing better than human. <coughs> and the way, yeah, so first we run, we ask Mosquito, this small model, give, give us a prediction. We compare it with ground truth. If it is equal, it goes to the main model training. If it's not equal, it is deprioritized. And the whole thing, uh, the whole cleaning system is quite complex. Uh, it goes like this. So we first apply a context-free grammar technique to analyze the structure of the document. Using that understanding, we build signature of a document. From that signature, we do clustering. So we, we group uh, documents into clusters. When we have clusters, we start looking for static words that are likely to be labels or some table headers or something that are repeatedly uh, constant in, 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 in the, in within the documents in the cluster. So we use them as anchors. Then we connect other fields to these anchors with so-called paths. So the path gives a signature to a field. Then we do the voting for what are the most popular paths in the group and uh, the popular paths are considered majority and uh, less least popular to consider outliers. So they are probably, um, probably results of a human mistake. Because, because in this group, let's say, 10 people think that invoice number is here and one thinks invoice number is there. So most likely, because that, that is obviously contradicting with, with those 10, so most likely that one person made a mistake. And, and by doing this deep understanding of the invoice structure and labels and paths, uh, we can now do this majority voting and remove outliers because we have a knowledge about invoice structure. <coughs> Once we have removed these 
outlier paths, we make uh, extraction templates, we re-extract the data with extraction templates, we compare the extracted data with ground truth and then things that are not equal, considered outliers, we remove them from data set and then we train the main model. So it goes, the process goes like this. And everything is controlled with user interface. Um, this is how it looks like. This is a dashboard. Here we see the rows of this table are groups and the columns are different fields that we extract. The color coding is how, m how much outliers we have found there, what is the quality of uh, ground truth, and if it's red, it means that there is something really, really bad within that group. There is uh, some systematic mistake. And uh, you can see that it has found lots of problems automatically. Then we can actually drill down. We can go to each individual group, then see each individual invoice, and then what is the problem in that invoice. And, w and these numbers are the sample weights. So if it's one, then it's a sample weight one, it will go to the training. If it's zero, the model suspects that there's an outlier. So this will, this, it's like per field. So the document will be included, but this particular field will be ignored. <coughs> and sometimes model is just like hesitating, so it gives a sample weight 50%. So there is some suspect, but m maybe it is correct, maybe not. Then uh, there is another way to organize it, supplier view, that, that is just grouping based on the supplier. If we know the supplier, sometimes we don't know. So this, the grouping is more like a geometrical grouping. The supplier grouping is because we know from what company this invoice came. So that, that knowledge we, we have, so we can do the grouping based on that. But there could be different shapes of invoices and um, subgroups. Then we can get to the particular invoice. We can see the fields. So this field is matching ground truth. That red one doesn't match. So, so there is a problem here, no problem there. We can, we can see individual problems. And we, and uh, yep. Well, like, let's <coughs> say that the registration number is not valid. So, does that mean that the invoice is somehow broken or is that like a mistake in your system? <sighs> Which number? And in the, on the right, the red button. Okay, that one. Yeah. <coughs> it means that what, what has been found in this place is found by Mosquito. It's found with extraction template, yeah. and it mismatches the ground truth. So the, the human label, the human, has extracted something else. They, they have given different value for this. Uh, OK, well, it's not shown here. Actually, we are not allowed to show any cu customer-specific data, so it's obfuscated here. But uh, anyway. Anyway, the idea here is that the extraction is done with majority, with more popular path. And that seems to be different from, from what, for what, what, what we find in ground truth, in, in the labels. So some other field in this document was labeled as what, but Mosquito thinks it's different. So now there is a contradiction between, between a majority-based prediction and the particular sample. So the sample is under very big uh, suspect that it may be a human error. That's that's the way we do the data cleaning. So we uh, we deprioritize that pattern because we suspect it's not a majority thing. So it's anomaly, and maybe it, it is for good reason or maybe it is for bad reason. But we just remove it. Uh, by removing it, we reduce the number of errors in the final prediction of the final production model by 30%. So it's a lot of improvement. This, r this really works. And then we can also fix. Uh, so if we find a problem, uh, and we, it is obviously a systematic problem, we can actually fix the ground truth. Well, if, if we examine a large group where there is a large problem and we notice that, okay, there is a systematic problem there, 
we can just rely on the majority. So we rely on the predictions of Mosquito and we just copy them to ground truth straight in a batch. And we fix, like, we can fix thousands of samples at once. Once we have examined and we verified that, yes, it is indeed a human error, a systematic human error, we can manually fix it quickly. So that's how the data cleaning goes. And now, what is happening under the hood? Uh, Context-free grammars, invention of Noam Chomsky, uh, just a formal way of expressing part whole hierarchies in the string, and then once it sees the string, it tries to explain uh, the structure with uh, with the rules of composition that are described formally. One of these kind of uh, formalism is known as bacchus naur form that is used for uh, describing computer languages, syntax of computer languages. You have probably seen that bacchus naur form. But uh, for human languages, there are also grammars that, uh, that can uh, explain the structure of a sentence. Uh, you can apply the same approach to two-dimensional structures. So you can have formal language that describes uh, a formal two-dimensional structures, like mathematical formulae, uh, form-like documents, invoices, even facades of the buildings. Um, this is how our grammar looks like. So, for example, it says, okay, there is a label, there is a value. So, value is on the right-hand side of a label. So, you just say, okay, key value, horizontal, that's a label value, and it's on the right. So, it's very simple, the, the formal description. And then, uh, once this grammar, once you define this grammar, you can apply uh, parser algori uh, uh, algorithms. This one is Koki Yanga Kasami two-dimensional version of it that can parse mathematical formulae. Uh, uh, we are not using that particular algorithm, but this is the simplest one. Uh, it's just how, how these kind of things are analyzed. And this is the final result. So you get, um, from that model, you get uh, understanding of the invoice. Uh, it's not a complete parse. Because, uh, well, there are millions of types of invoices, you cannot define a grammar for all of them. But you, d you can define grammar for constituents. So the parse never goes to the top. It, it stops in the middle, but uh, at, the, at the moment when it stops, it already understands a lot. It understands that it's better to, to pair these things together. This is a label, this is a value. This is a stack of key value pairs. This is another stack. This is a table with a header. And so it, it, it gives you lots of understanding of the invoice structure, which then helps you making signature. Because then you take these red ones and make signature from that. You don't want to make signature from numbers, from anything that is like street addresses or things that are changing, because this is not a signature. Would you define a new template for, let's say, you start working in a new country, or like a new format of the old? All the templates here are automatically generated. We, we do not build any templates at all. Uh, this system is completely generic. It applies to all invoices from all the countries, all the languages, doesn't care, because we have built other type of knowledge into the model. We have, we have uh, built the uh, knowledge of a typical structures that may appear here. So we've built the rules that there could be like a label and then the value on the right of it. This is a typical case very 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 often happening in the invoice and then they stand one on top of another that's another structure that's a typical thing this is what we've encoded and it's completely generic it applies to chinese invoices arabic invoices yes the, the ground truth is coming from a huge group of people who are our subcontractors. And uh, it's, it's, it's a brute force. It's a very heavy job. And uh, it's also very expensive. And they make mistakes. Well, this thing also makes mistakes, by the way. Because sometimes it fails to understand the, the grammar. And it fails to parse the document. So this is a successful part. Uh, but there are also unsuccessful parses. So it's not perfect. 
but at least it is automatic. And uh, well, alternative solutions. Um, we want to re re replace CFG parser with machine learning, with a model that would replace signatures with embeddings. We can apply contrastive representation learning or Jeffrey Hinton's GLOM or Facebook Dyna to generate these embeddings. So this is what we try to do. Contrastive learning, the idea of contrastive learning is that you, you take the image, you, you have two versions of it, and then you want your embeddings to be uh, as close as possible for the images that are looking similar, and then as far as possible for the, lo uh, for the images that are looking different. And you know in advance uh, which are different, which are similar, because similar ones you, you create artificially with data augmentation. And then you say, okay, these are similar images, please give me similar embeddings. And if you take different images, you say, give me different embeddings. That's a contrastive learning. It's very efficient. We tried it with syllables in the invoice. We, we took the just small patches of the invoice image, 12 uh, by 12 pixels. We did some augmentations, some bit like shifted, rotated, darker, brighter. And then we want them to be encoded with the same vector. Vector is uh, drawn here as, as a color using Tisney uh, transformation. So you can see that in every column where there are sil similar syllables, the color is the same. But between different syllables, the uh, color is different. That's the idea of contrastive learning. The good thing about contrastive learning is that it builds very good representations. This is the image of the whole latent space of this model. And uh, uh, the points of the latent space are drawn with, uh, with a particular syllable. So we get the universe of syllables. And uh, we convert, of course, the vectors are multidimensional. We uh, you apply Tisney to convert them to two-dimensional. Tisney keeps the distance of far ve uh, further vectors are mapped to the further vectors. Closer vectors mapped to the closer vectors. So, so you, you keep the geometry. What what kind of sorry? Auto uh, variational autoencoders. Well, there is a there is a problem with variational autoencoders here. We we didn't try, and the reason is normally well you need you need to put uh, priors to these variational autoencoders. You need to assume and 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 the uh, normal assumption is that you have Gaussian distribution, which which works very well for cats and dogs and for images and photos and. Uh, uh, you can, let's say, understand without uh, labels that this person is smiling or not smiling or something. Because, because if you have a huge data set of, uh, of, of images of different people, uh, there is a normal distribution of these features. And, but with invoices, it's different. Invoices is, is a formal structure. And, uh, and uh, it is very unlikely that we get normal distribution. It's a discrete thing. And so we didn't even try to apply variational autoencoders here just because of the discrete nature of the problem. We, so we believe that this is not a good model for that. So we would rather apply formal model, which is a context-free grammar, which, which, which better fits to the domain. But who knows? Maybe variational autoencoders could be a, a good ones. But as you can see, in this universe of syllables, the similar syllables come to the, so the galaxies. This one contains letter W, that one contains letter Y, this one contains letter G. Nobody was labeling it. it. It did it automatically. So we liked it a lot. This is very good. This is how, if we apply this to invoice with these colors, this is how it encodes the invoice. Uh, another invention is from Jeffrey Hinton, another person who probably you know. Uh, he invented this GLOM thingy. So it's, it's another uh, alternative approach to analyzing part whole hierarchy in the image. Uh, with, uh, he, well, he introduces the concept of islands of agreement. So you first you start with random uh, idea of, of the image. You assign random vectors to areas of the image. And then you start rotating them little by little, making it so that they agree, agree with each other. The neighbor vectors would agree with each other. They form islands of agreement. And this is how you find the borders of the objects in, in, in the image. We, uh, GLOM is open source. 
So we installed it and applied to invoice image, and yeah, we have some islands of agreement. We have uh, some footer area, header area, some coarse grain. We couldn't apply it because it's a coarse grain, but the idea works. Another amazing thing is Dino from Facebook. They use also contrastive learning, but different flavor of it. It's so-called Biol, bootstrap your own latent, and it automatically detects images like this. So especially that bird is amazing because it's uh, the tail of the bird looks like a leaf, and then there is another leaf there that looks like a bird, and the model very precisely found the, the uh, area where the bird is. You know, it blends into the leaves, but the model has found very precisely. And the, the, the magic thing about that model is, is it's trained without labels. It's unsupervised. This is amazing. It finds these things by itself. Well, speaking, <laughs> speaking again about uh, universal models that can understand world without knowledge. This is one of these. But of course, there is a lot of uh, prior knowledge in involved here that, that helps it converge to these amazing results. We applied this model to invoices, and it, it indeed detects some areas of invoice. But again, coarse grain doesn't help. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> How far am I from the schedule? Oh, that's great. Okay. Yes, please. Well, well, the, the, we tried different approaches. One is the, this kind of visual transformer idea. With visual transformer, you split the image into, into uh, squares, and then you consider every square, um, you make uh, one vector for the square, as one encoding, and then you, okay, then you send a set of these visual vectors to the transformer, you do the transformation, and uh, eventually you come with uh, embeddings for these areas. But the pro there is a big problem here. The invoice image is, is not cats and dogs. It's, uh, it is a formal structure. And tiny areas, they have lots of meaning. If there is a, some number in the corner of the document, that number has a lot of meaning. You want to actually attend to that number a lot. Uh, so if we just do this kind of coarse grain splitting of the image, it is good for cats and dogs, but it's uh, not applicable to invoices. It gives two coarse grain. Uh, well, all these uh, things, they are based on visual transformers. And yes, they, they think your image is a cat and dog. And they find uh, where is the eyes of the cat, where are the ears of the cat. But it's too coarse grain. We cannot attend to uh, individual words there and extract the data from that. It's, it's not applicable. It works, but it's not applicable. So we choose another approach. We, uh, we encode words in this document. And we consider the surrounding areas of the words do I have a pointer device? There is, I guess, a stick somewhere. There is a stick, yes. Good, I like it. Right, so let's, let's say we take this word and we, we would consider the neighborhood of that word. So maybe this, 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 maybe this. Um, and then we apply local attention to these things. We encode them separately uh, using just characters and uh, taking just this local area we put it to transformer. Um, it gives us some embeddings and then we collapse these embeddings and we get one embedding for the word. Then what we do? Okay, then we need data augmentation. For contrastive learning, you need to, uh, to make a damaged pattern. 
So the damage in our case would be just we hide some of the words in the, in the invoice. We hide this. And then, of course, some members disappear. And then we re-encode it. And then we claim that encoding of the word would be the same, even if some neighbors disappear. So it would, wouldn't be uh, vulnerable to this kind of partial eclipse. And th this is what gives us augmentation. And of course, when we took different invoice, then, then we claim that these things should be as random as possible. And uh, we apply this Barlow twins loss, which, which is uh, one of the ways of doing contra contrastive learning. It works. It works pretty well. Uh, it is precise enough, um, it I but it doesn't compete with CFG so far, and it actually, once more, it proves the statement that more knowledge you put in the model, the more better model you get, more precise, because the knowledge of structure, when we, when we say that, okay, there are key value pairs, there are these vertical stacks of things, so, so we, we get a lot, a lot more knowledge about invoice structure into the CFG approach and it gives us the best results. But these alternative ones, they are also working, but they are least, uh, less accurate. Less accurate because they have less assumptions. So it works. Yep. More questions? Well, we, we didn't uh, <coughs> we didn't uh, use BERT directly, but we used um, Microsoft LMV2 model, which is designed for invoices, and that is using BERT under the hood. So yes, it does. Uh, it takes the text, it it does the OCR, then it uh, uh, uses pre-trained BERT encoder to give uh, nice embeddings to the words, and and the good thing about the BERT encoding is that it's semantic. So if it says total, there is already uh, knowledge that, okay, total is very likely to be label, right? So it has a dictionary kind of built into it. But then it becomes language specific, which we don't like because we need to work with all languages. And uh, well, there are other, other limitations. Um, it's not doing exactly what we want because another thing that we, what we want from this thing is once we get embeddings for the fields and they are reproducible, let's say, we know how to mark this field in this invoice with a vector. But we don't know what this field is. Then the, somebody comes and says, oh, this is total. This vector means total. Then there comes another invoice. And uh, it is looking similar. It gets the similar embedding. And we already know it's total. We know it from a single sample. So uh, with doing, when doing this data cleaning, we, we, we get for free single click learning or like one hot one shot learning so we can learn very reliably and very precisely from a single sample just because we have have pre-built unsupervised knowledge of the invoice structure so we've trained the model that gives embeddings to invoice areas and it gives consistently same embedding to the same area of the same invoice so now once we once we have these labels or kind of embeddings, now we can do simple mapping, even without machine learning, just a database, vector database that says, okay, this vector means invoice number. Next time you see this vector, it's invoice number. You see similar vector which is close to it, it's still invoice number. So there is a, some proximity limit that when it goes further, okay, then you say, okay, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe invoice number, maybe not, it's too far. But uh, if it is close enough, you have that knowledge and you have it from a single sample and it works. It works very reliably. So, and it's, it's an amazing feature because this, this model can understand you from the one example. And uh, we can also give this UI to our customers and this is what we do. Uh, so the, the customers can train this model. If they don't like the prediction, they just open the UI, they open the invoice they click different area. Let's say it has taken total from here and it should be taken from here. You just click it with the mouse. Say, okay, take it from here. One click. It says, okay, fine. I know. Okay, next time this invoice comes, I know where to take the total from. That's it. So it corrects, uh, it corrects uh, mistakes with a single click 
and it memorizes that and it will apply it consistently to all the future invoices. Kind of, of course, it has own coverage and accuracy, but uh, so far the numbers are pretty good. Well, in our terms, template is um, is a memory of mapping between embeddings and meanings. So, uh, when you do a single click, you click it, and you say this field is invoice number. The system memorizes that. Just one click, it memorizes it, and it uses it as a template for extracting other invoices of similar type. Of course, the whole invoice has embedding too. The whole image has embedding. And that embedding forms its own space. There are clusters there. So if uh, the similar invoice comes to the system and you have knowledge or template kind of, which points to this area in the, in the space of invoices, and uh, and now you get another invoice with, with the same, with a vector that is close to that cluster. Then you say, okay, well, it looks like I have some knowledge about that cluster. So you first uh, do the vector matching for the invoice uh, vectors. Then, then you look for knowledge that is available for that particular cluster. And this is, this is what we can be considered as a template, but it is not a template. It is just a knowledge repository which is structured after these vectors, embeddings. So it's a vector database. It's, an, it's not a classical template. So uh, let's say the same company sends you a different invoice that's like three pages long. Yep. Do you have problems like uh, that the system has trouble connecting this? Uh, well, it is challenging. It is challenging. What we do, well, it is page by page. So we consider every page individually. But if invoice uh, consists of several pages, then what we do, we, we just, okay, we just um, look at every page, give it a, a probability. That what is, how it is likely that this thing is here? And maybe on other page, there is more, more, more uh, confident answer. So maybe this page doesn't contain that at all. So model hesitates at looking for some similar vector. Well, there seems to be maybe that one, maybe not, I don't know. Well, it gives you very low confidence rates. And then another page comes where there is a field. And then it says, oh, confidently, well, yeah, yeah, this is the thing. And so then we just compare, for every page we compare that where is the most confident prediction, and we just take the most confident one. It that doesn't work always, because the most complex case is that they sometimes send multiple invoices in one PDF. Okay, that's it. So uh, it's impossible to extract uh, one value because there are m many values, all are correct. Well, in this case, model will give multiple confident predictions and we need to cope with it. Either we take the most confident one or we take all of them, sum them, parse them, sum them, and then see the one, the one that is like a sum of others. So maybe it is a multi-invoice with one total invoice attached and then we can do some kind of heuristics on top of it. Well, it is not deleting uh, the sample because it is per field. We feed the whole invoice to the model. The model makes a prediction simultaneously for all the fields. It is uh, like a colorful color map. It applies the heat. It, it, the prediction of the model looks like this. So it is a, a multi-component heat map. Uh, you cannot remove the, if you remove the whole invoice from the data set, you can remove it, but then you remove the knowledge about other fields that are correct. So you, you make this uh, unnecessarily, uh, you reduce the diversity of your data set unnecessarily. So instead of removing the sample, we use sample weight feature 
And, and in TensorFlow, if you have a multi-component output of the model, you can actually apply uh, sample weights to individual outputs. So it's like a colorful sampling, uh, sample weight. So sample weights may be also per component of the output. And this is what we use heavily. So we apply sample weights per components of the output. And this way we, we say that, okay, well, this is a confident one, uh, sample weight one, this is a confident one, sample weight one, but that is, that area, maybe this is a due date or something in voice number, but this is not confident, we give it sample weight zero five, or, or zero. Well, th this is a negative boosting, but because this is, <laughs> you, you, Instead of increasing sample weight, you're decreasing sample weight. That's negative boosting. So you, you reduce the influence of that sample to your model because you suspect that this is, this is a wrong thing to learn. Uh, quantification. Well, we we didn't really try. We didn't we didn't uh, do any any uh, like uh, optimizing the performance, the computational performance, uh, doing some kind of con contrasting or quantification. We we tried to go from uh, float 32 to float 16 for for performance optimization, but this is not quantification. This is just this kind of uh, reduction of the dimensionality of the uh, vectors. I'm sorry, I, I mentioned that uh, quantifying uncertainty, that how certain... Oh, oh, that, that, is, that is a study of Yuhani. This is, this is where Yuhani is expert. He, he worked with us, yeah, he worked with us and he developed a model that individually uh, predicts the confidence of the answer. Yeah, it, well, yeah, it is very important because when you have a prediction, we want to reach the maximum accuracy. It's okay if we drop some of the patterns. We, we, we say that, okay, this invoice we cannot process, let's send it to manual processing. That's, that's perfectly fine. The worst thing is that we say that, yes, we can do it. We can predict this invoice and then we predict it wrongly. That's the worst thing. So confidence estimate in this case is very important because it can help us uh, throwing away the uncertain answers that potentially contain errors. And, and th this way we boost accuracy to above human. We, we also use uh, another boosting technique called committee boosting. We, we actually train six models simultaneously. And we train them on different data slices. So if the error is in one of the slices, it will not be in other slices. And so if the, that field and that prediction is affected by the error, the, the different models will disagree because one of them will be trained with an error, uh, others not. Uh, and so if the committee disagrees, we drop it. That's, that's one way of estimating confidence. Is like if, if six models agree, all of them give the same prediction, this is a good sign that it is most likely it's been trained with consistent data. But if it, they disagree, then we drop it. It also, uh, well, this was the first uh, boosting we've done and it boosted us 30%. Then we've done the data cleaning and boosted another 30%. This, this way we uh, went above human. Okay, thanks for Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this was excellent, excellent start of the visiting lecture series. So somehow uh, having both the practical side of the story and also your a bit philosophical side of the story. So.